Okay, everyone. So welcome for welcome to the second day of the Sensing Rivers 2020 workshop. Uh, thanks everyone for joining for the second day. And uh, today, as you know, uh, I was sharing the agenda in the slides, and uh, probably you will <clears throat> you will see here that today we have two sessions presentations again. The first one is uh, I'll be presenting on. Um, so that. Uh, Okay, let me share again this. The, the... So here the agenda for today. So we'll have a presentation first. Uh, I'll do it on the monitor, the reservoir operation using satellite remote sensing, and then we'll have a break for 15 minutes. And then the second presentation session today will be on uh, using satellite to uh, estimate the evapotranspiration using a method called CBAL. This uh, talk will be uh, uh, given by Indira. And then we will have another 15 minutes break and then uh, the practical session for the second exercise on Google Earth Engine. Uh, I shared this exercise yesterday, so uh, I'm not sure if you got any chance to look at it or not, but we discuss more about the, the practical session, uh, maybe and when we come to this session later. Um, just a couple of uh, reminders before we uh, start the first session. So uh, one thing I, I, I want to try for today and maybe tomorrow as well. So feel free to ask questions even in the chat box. I know we have many participants from the Middle East and uh, uh, they might be interested to ask some questions, even if it's in Arabic. So it's okay if you want to ask the question in Arabic. Uh, I'm totally fine. You can send the question in, uh, in the chat box, and then I will try to, I mean, a kind of monitor the chat box and translate this to everyone. So feel free to do that, and it's, it is no problem at all. At all, we are here to, you know, we want to learn. So uh, we don't want to make the language like a barrier that we cannot learn because just of the language. So. Feel free to ask the question if it's in, in Arabic. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll be happy that we, we to have more questions if it's, we don't have to, I mean, to worry about the, the language for, for now. We just want to, to learn. So you can uh, send a question in the chat box and then I'll try to monitor that. Uh, so I think this, this is everything. Just I want to uh, uh, just kind of remind you about it. Uh, and then, uh, Maybe I will try now sharing my uh, slides and starting the first presentation. <laughs> so uh, I'll be presenting today. This is the first, as I said, the presentation presentation session for. Uh, uh, for today, and I'll be presenting uh, uh, on adapting the reservoir operation in the transboundary Nile River Basin, with the goal to achieve a kind of a win-win solutions for the countries of the Nile Basin, especially for uh, uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and, and Egypt, with the challenges you know uh, all of these uh, countries are facing. So, just a quick introduction about me. Probably most of you, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a graduate research assistant at University of Washington and the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering. And my research focus is to uh, to uh, study the food, energy, water uh, system, uh, what we call like the few system in a nexus approach, uh, in order to achieve a sustainable solution for water management, especially in the transboundary basins. And the work that I'm doing now is in the Nile River Basin, which is one of the largest transboundary basins in the world. Um, uh, and as I can see from these two pictures, I just, uh, I'm sharing these two pictures intentionally to see that I, all of you know, you know that the Nile River is flowing from uh, the upstream in, the, in Ethiopia. And this is the very beautiful view of the uh, Ethiopian Falls. And then it goes downstream to, to Egypt where the pyramids uh, are located. Uh, but uh, I know the pictures are, are, are very nice, but uh, what I want to also to em emphasize here is the, you can see that there is a big difference in the climate. It's very wet in Ethiopia and it's, it's very dry in Egypt. And 
probably will come to this later in, in, in my talk. So, uh, this is first a Nile River basin. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, so this is an I river basin. It's you know it's uh, the longest river in the world. It's uh, crossing eleven countries in uh, northeastern Africa, starting from uh, from da from uh, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, with, with the White Nile, and then the White Nile uh, goes downstream uh, until it reaches Khartoum, where it meets the the Blue Nile that's coming from Ethiopia. And then at Khartoum, it moves uh, downstream to, to Egypt. And we can see that the, the flow from the White Nile represents about 14%, while the, the flow from the Blue Nile represents about uh, 86%. Uh, so these two sources are the main sources of the Nile River, and it's home to more than 200 million people. And we can see in this chart if, uh, let me just share the, uh, the laser point, okay. So you can see in this chart that most of the population of the Nile countries, they are actually living inside the basin. For example, if we look at Egypt, uh, you see this is whole Egypt, but most of the population is actually living out inside the Nile basin here, along the Nile Valley and also in the Nile Delta. And the, the chart is showing that around 96% of the population in Egypt is only living in this area uh, along the Nile, uh, uh, the Nile basin. Um, it's the same for most of other countries like the Sudan as well. It's like around 90% of the population just live in, uh, uh, along the Nile Basin, but the rest of the area is like kind of a desert and there is not that much population. So here is the hydrology of the Nile River Basin. You, you probably know that it's most of the rain happens in the upstream of the White Nile and also the upstream of the, of the Blue Nile. Uh, which is a tropical and semi-tropical, uh, subtropical uh, regions, and, uh, and most of the downstream areas in, uh, in part of Sudan and also in Egypt, it's kind of a very arid and uh, very arid climate, which is has almost zero precipitation, uh, and uh, that's why actually, as I said in the in my first slide, I shared these two pictures to see that it's very wet in the upstream of the basin, while as we go downstream, it's very dry and arid, uh, arid regions. Uh, talking in terms of the water use, most of the water use in the Nile River Basin is used for uh, uh, agriculture. And we can see here in the map, it's mapping the, uh, using actually satellite and mapping uh, an index called uh, a normalized, uh, or I mean, using an index called normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. Uh, but anyway, it's showing the kind of differences in the land cover uh, of the Nile River Basin. And we can see that most of the green, this green are actually the, the crop area or the agriculture. So it's mostly in Sudan, uh, some of them is in Ethiopia, but also in Egypt, we can see that along the Nile Valley and the Nile Delta, there is a lot of water used for irrigation. And also the chart here is showing for the three countries, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, how much of the water is used for different sectors. And we can see like, maybe like more than 85% in the three countries of the water is used for uh, irrigation. And agriculture is very important actually for the economy of the three countries. It's uh, one third of the GDP, it's the gross domestic product uh, in the Nile Basin. The major crops here is wheat, maize, cotton, and rice. And if we look just at uh, uh, for Egypt compared to the rest of the Nile countries, we can see that the product or the crop yield from Egypt is in, for different crops, it's actually kind of like three, three times or two times what, whatever the other countries are producing. So it's, it's, Egypt is representing a very, very important uh, kind of crop producer for the rest of the, of the basin and uh, probably for, for Egypt itself as well. So there's something that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, very important in terms of when we, we think about the water use for, for Egypt and the rest of the uh, countries as well in the Nile Basin. So I'll show some of the challenges in the Nile Basin in, in, in the term of the food energy water, that's what I said in, in, the, in the beginning of uh, my presentation. I'm interested to look at this uh, system in a nexus approach and nexus means that we are trying to uh, look at the interconnection between the different systems like the water, how the water is affecting the energy 
for example, water is being used to, uh, for the cooling of the thermoelectric power plants or something, or water is used also to produce hydropower uh, uh, in, in the dams. So this is how the water and energy is related. The same for water and food. Water is used for the irrigation of the crops, so it's used also for the pr production of the, of the food. So I'll, I'll explain some of the changes in terms of food, energy, and water. And the first, let's, let's take a view at the, the first challenge, which is the food security in the Nile River Basin. So the map here is showing an index called the Global Hunger Index, which is just an index uh, to, to reflect the food security or the food availability in the Nile. Uh, in the, uh, this is a global map. So I will show the global map and then show, showing it later for uh, Africa. You can see the global map uh, is showing that most of the countries in Africa in general they are actually at alarming or extremely alarming uh, conditions in terms of the food uh, security. And here, even if we focus more in Africa, you can see that the countries in Africa are actually suffering from uh, food, uh, food shortage. And uh, if, we, if we look at the Nile countries, we can see in this chart that uh, most of the Nile countries, they have around 20-35% um, of global hunger index, which is indicates like a serious alarming of food security. Uh, except Egypt, it's, Egypt is a little bit uh, less or it's a kind of moderate in terms of the global hunger index, uh, uh, global hunger index, sorry for that. Uh, so then the second challenge, let's look also at the electricity and uh, the map here is showing the, uh, the, the population, the, the, the percentage of population that uh, has access to electricity. So you can see like, for example, United States or South America, they have 100% of the population, they have access to electricity. Uh, the, the same for Australia, for example, but if you look at, uh, at Africa, let's focus on Africa because you see in Africa that 620 million people in Africa, they don't have access to electricity. And uh, I know that it's, it's North Africa, like Egypt, Libya, Algeria, they have access like around uh, more than 90% of the population, they have access. But the rest of the African countries, like you don't have that much access to uh, electricity. And this actually probably will be more challenging in the future as the population is increasing. And we can see the chart is showing here the population, how it's increasing from 1970 to 2020. But uh, even if we, if we look at uh, more towards the future, up to 2050, you see the population in the three countries, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia is, is growing faster and faster. And so having this, population growth, I think we are expecting that more people will suffering from the uh, electricity access. Uh, again, here is the electricity, but using a, this is a satellite image actually, that's uh, reflecting the night time. So it's just showing uh, at night, uh, which cities or which uh, uh, locations over the world that are uh, using electricity at night. So for example, if we, uh, uh, like kind of focus in Africa, you can see here, like this is a night valley and the night delta, it's showing the electricity use or the night time there. And uh, which probably also indicates a kind of ways the population is mostly concentrated. So most of the population in, in Egypt, as I said in the beginning, is actually around the night valley and also, also in the night delta. So let's uh, talk in terms of the water scarcity as well. This is the third challenge. So again, the global map is showing that most of the region, they have uh, uh, access to uh, uh, water with, I mean, where this map is showing a kind of like improved water quality or uh, the access of the population to uh, water with a, good, with, with a good quality. So most of the world, like the US, again, most of South America or uh, Russia, they have, good access for uh, for the water. But if we look uh, more closer at Africa, but even here, I mean, it's not only Africa, but also for South Asia. You can see in South, South Asia, they have also not like 100% of the people, they have access to improved water. But some of this yellow is indicating like 65 to 83% of the people that they have actually uh, uh, access to improved water. And this is below the, the average of the world. And if we look closely at, uh, if you look here at Africa, you can see that most of the countries, they are actually less than 65% even, which is like uh, this orange color. Uh, again, uh, this map is showing a kind of the water consumption and water uh, availability. Uh, it's not exactly the water availability, but it's showing the 
the water that's uh, uh, produced at each of these countries versus the water is, that it's used. So for example, Egypt, it's, has no, like, it has no precipitation. So probably most of the water that's coming, that's uh, available for Egypt is available outside. It's coming from, as you know, from the Nile River from Ethiopia or from the, Nile, the White Nile that's coming from uh, uh, Uganda or uh, Tanzania in the upstream of the basin. But the water use in Egypt is, is very high and you can compare the numbers. If Egypt, the precipitation is very low, but it has a very high number of water use. Compare this, for example, for Ethiopia is like the picture is kind of reversed. So they have like around uh, the, the, you can see that the water generated over there is very high. Uh, this is the, the water uh, resources. I, it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, the numbers actually is in billion cubic meters, which is like a kilometer cube. So it has 122 kilometer cube versus the use is only 5.6. And uh, yeah, this is the rest. Some other countries in Africa, I mean, Congo, because they have this uh, large river in Congo. So they have, a, the, it's producing a lot of water over there, but still the use is very less. So the point, that, the point actually, in, uh, I want to share in this, uh, this slide is to see the differences between the water generated for each country versus the water that's uh, being used. Uh, and again, here the map is showing just uh, the trend uh, based on different years for the access to improved water uh, in the Nile River Basin. <clears throat> I think, sorry, this is not the Nile River Basin, it's actually for different regions of the, uh, of the world. So it's showing different colors for different uh, regions. But anyway, the trend is, is going down that we have access to improved water. So another challenge, which is uh, very important and probably the uh, kind of focus of uh, my, my, my uh, talk as well, that we have transboundary dams that's coming in. And uh, as you can see in this map, it's showing uh, the existing dams in the Nile River Basin. We have a around 11 existing dams. And the largest existing dam now is the highest one dam in Egypt. But we have also hydropower dams planned for the future. We have around 35 based on a database that generated uh, a couple of years ago by, uh, uh, by Zorf in 2015. We have this database for the future hydropower dams. And there's around 35 dams probably that they come, can come in the future. And three of them, like you can see some of them, they can be in Ethiopia that, to build these dams. And uh, there's four dams that are currently under construction. One of them is actually the, you know, the Grand Ethiopian Mersens Dam, which is expected to be the largest hydropower dam in, uh, in, in Africa. It has uh, its uh, storage capacity is 74 kilometer cube, and it's controlling the Blue Nile. And you, you probably, all of you, you know that it's uh, kind of generating a political tensions between the, the three countries in the Nile Basin, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan. It's, it's, it's a very large and it will, probably impact the water in the in the uh, in the downstream countries but and we'll see that in, in my, later in my presentation but it's actually also interesting that uh, there is a, an article online that's uh, uh, written by prof assistant professor here in, in, in Canada and University of Toronto she's saying that it's, it's probably this is the most important dam you probably haven't heard of so it means like it's it's very important I think to to learn about the GERD and how how this GERD is uh, impacting not only the, the 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 water the water in the in the in the basin but also kind of the po the politics in the in the basin as well and we will see this maybe in uh, the next slides uh, I'll try to show you how the shift in the power of the Nile has been uh, it changed it so the, this infographics is showing the different treaties or agreement on the basin. So 1959, you know, there is this treatment uh, agreement between Egypt and Sudan to share the Nile River uh, basin with 66%, uh, around 66% of water to be for Egypt and 23% for the water to be for Sudan. And then 2010, the rest of the countries, uh, except Egypt and Sudan, the, uh, the agree for a new deal. And this deal will give a kind of uh, uh, a power for the upstream countries to have new projects and constructing new new dams, and uh, uh, then in 2011, Ethiopia actually started working on this GERD. In 2015, the Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia they agreed to uh, have a deal to perform some technical studies and also uh, uh, kind of like 
making sure they are not hurting the interests of each country. So if you are following the news, you probably have seen some of this in the media, but I just also want to, uh, uh, to say that the GERD is not like, a, it's not a new idea that came to Ethiopia. This actually was a project that has been proposed a long time ago in 1964 by study that has been done by uh, USBR. This is actually the United States uh, Bureau of Reclamation. So they did a study for Sudan to, uh, for, sorry, for Ethiopia to find the proposed locations for, uh, uh, for, for uh, potential dams. And one of them was actually this one that I have the start is the GERD. And then, but that's actually the, it, it, didn't ha it, didn't, it didn't start, uh, the construction uh, w was not started until 2011 when the Prime Minister of Ethiopia uh, announced the launching of the hydropower plant. And then in, nine, in 2013, that they started the, the construction with the diversion of the Nairobi Basin. But then in the media started asking, okay, if th this is a threat to Egypt because probably less water will be coming to Egypt. But also, I mean, in the media are saying maybe it's a benefit to Sudan because it will kind of uh, ending the flooding that's happening in, in, in Sudan. Uh, and just again, the storyline, Keep going. Uh, if we, if we, are, we were following this, uh, the news in 2015, they agreed for this uh, declaration of principles. And then later in 2019, last year, by the end of the last year, the three countries said that they are, the negotiations failed between the three countries and they, are, they, they, they were not able to reach an agreement on how the dam would be filled or operated in the future. And then Egypt asked, uh, uh, kind of like asking the US to. Uh, come in the situation and try to help with this negotiation. So they met in the U.S. in November 2019, and later they met again in January here in, in, in the U.S. But uh, I think then the, 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 the negotiation actually also is still failed even when after they, they met here in the U.S. And even after that, the, the Ethiopian Prime Minister, he asked South Africa to, to get into the situation and intervene again into the situation. Uh, and I think it's, it's still running, the negotiation is still running. And uh, even I was checking the news recently, Uganda as well, they, they received a license for, to, to build a new dam on the White Nile. And it's probably like a Chinese, I think, firm that they're gonna construct this dam. So I think it's a kind of like, the situation is kind of complicated. So uh, I just want to show you that the news is to give you an idea about how this was actually uh, situation was growing in the last uh, years. So let's go back again to uh, the science and the changes that I've mentioned just to recap some of these changes. So I, I, I said one of the changes that it's a transboundary river. And what I mean here is that, as I said, it's shared between 11, between 11 countries. So if you want to do anything, you have to negotiate between the 11 countries, which make it making it more challenging and uh, to, to kind of manage the water resources. Then again, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, one of the big changes in the developing nations is data, data availability and data sharing. So the data, the measured data, most is not available in the developing nation, but even if it's available, we are uh, kind of suffering from sharing the data, especially the agencies that are collecting the data, they are not making it available. Uh, as I said, there is a population growth in the, in the Nile countries, which will probably increase the food demand, the energy demand, and plus also the changes from the, the, the dams that's coming into the basin. And we, ha we don't have to also uh, uh, forget the climate variability. Uh, uh, we, we don't know that next year the, the, the stream flow or the, the precipitation that's coming will be uh, uh, like a kind of um, dry or wet here that we have like uh, enough precipitation for uh, the stream flow, like, like uh, I mean, like stream, like enough precipitation to produce a stream flow that's enough to uh, meet the demands downstream or not. So the, the climate change, the climate variability is very important uh, factor to consider when we are kind of studying the food energy water system. So the overarching goal of my, my work, or this is actually my PhD work, is to drive adaptive reservoir operating policy for the existing dams in the Nile Basin. Uh, under these different challenges that I just mentioned in the previous slide. And my focus will be in the, the existing dam will be the highest one dam in Egypt under the challenges that's coming from these different factors, including the, the GERD or the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia. So just before moving forward, just a 
to make sure you're be familiar with these two acronyms. So I'll be using HAD to refer to highest one dam and using also GERD to refer to Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia. So I developed this satellite-based blueprint. It's a framework that's kind of modeling the situation in the Nile River Basin. So it has a two components, modeling the upstream part of the basin and then modeling the downstream part of the basin. And the upstream here, we, we have a hydrologic model. Uh, I'll show this later, but uh, it's modeling the upstream conditions and then routing the flow into the, into the dam. We have also a reservoir model that's optimizing the, the operation of the model for uh, hydropower generation or for the water use in the downstream. Again, we have another reservoir model in the downstream. So the difference between the upstream and downstream is actually that we have in the upstream, it's kind of a planned dam. It's not existing. Like in my case, for example, it's GERD. And the downstream, it's an existing dam. So in my, in my, in my studies, for example, is the HAD or the highest one dam. And then we also have a model for the downstream. So the downstream model is kind of evapotranspiration model. Uh, and this model is intended to estimate the water use for irrigation. So kind of like having an idea about how much water is being used in the downstream. So for each, comp for each part of this uh, blueprint, we use a satellite. For example, we use a satellite for, uh, as a forcing for the hydrologic model. We use a satellite to like SRTM to derive the area elevation curve of reservoir. And you'll actually learn about that today in the practical session, how to do it uh, using the SRTM. And we also use a, we use a satellite to, for the uh, estimation of evapotranspiration using a, a method called the CBAL, or which stands for Surface Energy Balance Algorithm for land. And you will learn about that in the next uh, presentation uh, be given by Indira. So we have this blueprint. It's uh, kind of mostly relying on sa using satellites and also using different models. So I'll be in my first study focus on the, the, the back model showing how we validate this model and also how we use a satellite to drive the, the operation of uh, high as one dam. So the first question that we are asking in this study is how if the satellite observation with the hydrologic modeling can be used to understand the reservoir operation and uh, more specifically the re existing reservoir operations in the Niger Basin with a focus on the highest one dam. So we, we have two components here. The first is the hydrologic model and we use the variable infiltration capacity model. This model is actually developed and maintained here at the University of Washington. It's called the VEC model. So we did, we, we, uh, uh, I did the model at, for a special scale of 0.1 degree. The temporal scale is daily for 37 years from 1981 to 2017. And we did the calibration validation for five years. So here's an example for the validation, for example, for the Khartoum, I, I will show it also for in the, in the next slide. But the second component is actually the, to derive the reservoir operation using a water balance, uh, water, water balance approach. And I'll explain this later as well in the next slides. So just uh, here an idea about the, the bit calibration at the Khartoum station. And you can see, I mean, this is a daily scale. This is a monthly scale. And, the lower panel panels at the monthly scale. And you can see that the model is able to capture the stream flow variability and also the, 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 the monthly and the daily stream flow uh, very well. I mean, if you compare the, 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 the modeled stream flow versus the measured one, you can see that they are uh, in a very good agreement. For example, the R square is 0.94 for the monthly calibration. And uh, the same for if we look at the validation, it's the monthly validation, the R square is 0 0.96. So uh, it's, it's, it's performing very well, I think, for the Hartone station, which is a very important station, as you know, because this is the, out, the outlet of the Blue Nile Basin. So here's the reservoir modeling when, and, uh, where we use the water balance for highest one dam. So just to give you an idea what, what I mean by the reservoir modeling, is kind of asking the question if the highest one, how is, it, how is the highest one dam being operated? Can we understand how highest one dam is being operated or not? And this means how much water is being released or stored every month. And can we do that using satellite? And what is the skill of using satellite? So the water balance at the highest one dam, just imagine that the, the highest one dam or the lack, 
uh, Lake, Lake Nasser and uh, the highest one down reservoir is a kind of a tank that we have inflow and we have outflow. We have the precipitation coming in that's for highest one down, you probably know that's around zero, so we assume it's a zero. We have also evaporation and we have the change in the storage inside the tank. So the water balance, we first have the inflow from the VIX simulations with the hydrologic model. Then we have the evaporation using an energy balance, which is actually explained in most of the hydrology textbooks. And then we, we have the storage change using the satellite, and I will explain this, how we did it using the SRTM, Landsat, and altimetry data. So how to do that? We first drive the area elevation curve using SRTM, and uh, as I said, we, we will learn that in the practical session, but basically we kind of driving different elevations from the SRTM, which is a satellite mission that uh, uh, flew, I think, in 2000. And so they the can give us an indication about what is the elevation or the, the surface water elevation over the lake. So we have this, and uh, for each elevation, we can also calculate the area. So we have a, an idea about the, air, the reservoir area elevation curve. And then we use another satellite called altimetry. This is uh, another kind of satellite that we can use the observation from this satellite to uh, estimate the water level over the, over the lakes. And uh, here's actually a comparison between this altimetry observations versus the, the measured observation for the fi uh, five years from 1998 to 2002. And you can see the R-square is very, very high. It's 0.99. So the altimetry is actually very, very well capturing the, the water level over highest one dam reservoir. So going back, if we go back to the area elevation curve, if we have an idea about the elevation, then we can go back to this curve and uh, getting the reserve or calculating the reservoir area based on this relation. So here is an example for uh, the operation of highest one dam. So the, the red line is showing the measured again from, from 1998 to 2002. The blue line is showing the model using this satellite approach. And you can see, I mean, for especially for the winter season and the spring season, it's it's very close. But uh, maybe later there is actually the the the, the model is underestimating the, the the release, and the y-axis showing us is the release from highest one dam. So it's kind of underestimating the release from highest one dam. And but if we look more closely at only one year, like 2002, we can see that actually the performance of the satellite model is improving. And the reason for that, actually, you know, the satellite has, as Dr. Faisal mentioned yesterday, there is many uncertainties in the, the satellites. And one of them is the satellites we use in the VIX simulations. So this will uh, uh, kind of introducing uncertainties because the VIX simulations are not perfect, you know. Also the altimetry water level, I did a sensitivity analysis. Uh, although I said that the altimetry is very close to the measured water level for highest one dam, but saying that is still, even if there's a very, very small change in the, in the water level, this will actually reflect on, the, uh, on this equation or the water balance equation, because you know, the highest one dam, the lake is very, very large lake. So any, very, any small change in the water level, this will actually make a big difference in the, the calculation of the water area. And so it will make a big change here in the, uh, in the outflow. But I think in general, we can say that the monthly hydrolysis that we are using satellites is in a good agreement. And I think that the, the, this modeling framework uh, can be further used to understand the, the operation and the filling of the Gerd reservoir, which we actually uh, do it in our uh, next study. So in the next study, so the first, actually this is the first study. So the, in the next study that we, we looked here at the, the second question, which is how can the highest one dam adapt its operation to the filling of the upstream transboundary gird dam. And again, we use the same uh, blueprint, uh, but this time we, we, we think we, we, we focus more on the gird and the hat and also the downstream water use. So just uh, maybe an overview of the gird, maybe probably most of you know, but the gird is a hydropower dam in, uh, in, uh, at the boundary between Sudan and Ethiopia. So it's being constructed by the Ethiopian uh, and it has a hydropower capacity of 6,450 uh, megawatt with 16 turbines uh, uh, installed. And we can see this is actually the most recent Google Earth, Google Earth image. It's showing the, the main dam and also there is a saddle dam. So the saddle dam, the idea of the saddle dam actually to increase the storage capacity of the, of the, of the, of the, of the gird. 
Uh, here again, this is a stream flow that's uh, coming into the, the, the GERD using our VIC simulations. We can see that the median flow is around 47.5 kilometer cube. And uh, just to put this number in context, you know that Egypt on average, I mean, most of the textbooks are saying that Egypt on average is receiving 55.5 kilometer cube. So 47.5 kilometer cube is actually would be the inflow into the, the GERD. And in terms of uh, the monthly variations, you can see most of the of the stream flow uh, or most of the precipitation actually happens in the summer uh, between June and uh, October. Uh, and uh, actually the peak stream flow is in August. Uh, so some of the questions is like, how long Ethiopia will take to fill the dam? So this is kind of the impacts of the GERD. So the question, the first question is, uh, how long the Ethiopia will take to fill the dam, and then how how actually the dam will be operated even after being filled, and then how the highest one dam can adapt to both the filling the operation scenarios. Uh, again, just to uh, this is very important that the kind of the median flow, the average flow is around 47.5 kilometer cube. The capacity of the reservoir storage is 74 kilometer cube, and what that this actually is important why because in, on average that the Ethiopia has to take like two years to fill the dam. This is the fastest uh, uh, fastest filling approach that Ethiopia can do is to fill the dam in two years. And so that's why we did the testing scenarios. So we test from two years up to 12 years of filling scenarios for the GERD. And then we use the historical inflow from our big simulations. And then we look at the impact in the downstream. So the figure here is showing the y-axis is showing the annual GERD outflow. So this is the GERD, the outflow from the uh, from the GERD after being filled. Then there are different scenarios, and the x-axis is showing, for example, two-year filling scenario, three years, and so on. Uh, this uh, actually insight is showing just the the the, the 37 years of uh, flow or inflow into the GERD. So this is the inflow, and this is actually the outflow. But let's just take an example. For example, two years of filling. That's uh, and considering the variability in the stream flow, we can say that the median outflow from the GERD can, can be around 10 kilometer cube. So comparing 10 kilometer cube to 47.5 kilometer cube, you can see you can see that like we can expect around 80 percent, I think, of reduction for the water that's coming to the downstream. Let's move forward with more filling scenarios. We can see like around seven year filling scenario, it can go up to 40. Maybe the average would be around 40 kilometer cube, which is kind of close to the, uh, is not, I mean, is, the reduction is not that much like the, like the two year feeding scenario. And even if you go, go further after seven year feeding scenario, we see that there is no big differences between the, the, the outflow of the GERD. If we, if Ethiopia is to fill the dam in seven years or more than seven years, we can see that the median is actually kind of becomes the same. So let, what we conclude from is that less, less impacts downstream if we are following the feeding scenario of seven years or more. But let's let's look at the highest one dam itself and how it can adapt its operation. So the way I followed here is using a, a stress index called the water supply stress index. And basically this is an index that's relating the water consumption in the downstream uh, by the water supply. And as I said in the beginning, the water consumption in Egypt is mostly used by irrigation. So I focus here on the irrigation water use. And what is the water supply? This is basically the highest one dam release. So if you are thinking about the, the water use in, in Egypt, most of the water is actually be, being uh, supplied by also the, the, the highest one dam. So the water supply will be the highest one dam uh, release and the water consumption will be the irrigation water use in the, in the downstream. So how did we calculate the water consumption? We as I mentioned, we use a, uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, we use the CBAL approach to estimate the evapotranspiration or the ET. So we did this for using satellite images for uh, uh, the 40 years from 2014 to 2017. And this, the thick black line is showing the average. Mm -hmm. And we can see that the satellite actually is able to capture the, the, the peak season or the two seasons of crop in Egypt. This one season that's happening in, uh, uh, by the end of the winter, and the other season is the summer, the summer season. So this is the water consumption, which is the numerator of the, the WASI or the stress index. Then the second is the water supply, just using the, the satellite base framework that I showed in the, in the first study. We also can have an idea about the, 
the highest one time releases. So we get the releases for the same years. And again, the, the black line is showing the average. So if we divide the water consumption by the water supply, we can have the stress in the downstream of the highest one dam. So the stress, actually this is the chart for the stress for different months. And we can see that the stress is sometimes is very high, especially when the release is less. During these months, like in the beginning of the year, January to March, and also at the end of the year between 10, October and uh, December. Uh, Probably sometimes the stress is more than one, which means that the surface water supply is not enough to to uh, to cover the demand in the downstream. And probably Egypt is using a, a, some. I mean, some regions in Egypt in Egypt are using groundwater, and maybe as well the rainfall in the in the probably in the maybe at in the Alexandria or some of the regions in the Nile Delta when they have uh, some rain that's happening in the winter. Uh, but what is what, what is interesting here that we found is that stress is very low during the summer. If you noted, if you see this region between uh, May and and, uh, and August, Egypt has to release the water from the Aswan Dam, and actually the stress is very low. It can reach down to 0.5, and 0.5 means like like. 50% of the water that is being released is not used for irrigation. It might be for sure used for something else and uh, like the uh, cooling of uh, power plants or something, but that's actually very low stress. And so this opening, like the idea that ice Dam actually can adapt its operation in the future by storing more water during uh, the, the summer uh, months. So I'll show you different scenarios by changing the stress during the summer. Uh, but before going to that, and also testing different filling scenarios, another, another important uh, factor is uh, the highest one dam level when the GERD starts its filling. So I don't know if the GERD will start the filling this year or maybe they already started or maybe they will start next year. But an important factor is what is the level of highest one dam at that time? So I tested two different scenarios. One of them is a very optimistic scenario using a high, uh, highest one dam level and one is the worst case scenario which is lowing, using a low uh, level so we I, I selected this based on the last 10 years so based on the water levels from 2011 to 2020 the lowest highest one dam level was in 2012 which reaches a it treated around 169 meter and then in, in in 2019 actually last year the the highest one dam level reached around 179 and by the way these levels were uh, are in in July, so I just selected July as the the month just right before the GERD will start filling its dam. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's reservoir. So again, uh, if we uh, here is testing. I mean, different scenarios for the highest one dam level during the GERD filling scenario, and I will show here only two scenarios. One the three year filling scenario as an example of the the fast approach filling scenario, and the seven year filling scenario, which is the a kind of a slow feeling scenario. So, and uh, I will show also two uh, scenarios for in terms of stress. So I will follow this, the stress that's being, uh, uh, that I just, I mean, kind of uh, estimated from the Sibal approach or the WASI. So this is the current stresses without changing or making any adaptation to the downstream or to highest one dam. And the other, uh, scenario is testing also an adaptation strategy by changing the stress during the summer. As I said, the, the stress was around 0.5. What if the highest one dam store more water and releasing, releasing less, less water? So if it's releasing less water, the stress in downstream will go up from maybe 0.5, I hear, tested like 0.7. So it's a kind of playing with the conditions in the upstream, which is the GERD feeling scenario, and the downstream, which is actually the, the stress conditions in the downstream. So I'm showing here for the first, for the worst case scenario, when if the highest one dam will be at a level of 169. And what we, if we just focus first at the three year feeling scenario, you can see that by the end, actually, the, uh, again, the, the x-axis is showing the, the this is the, the, the feeling years. So the first year, second year, third year of feeling. And the y-axis is showing the highest one dam level. So if it starts, for example, at 169, by the end of the, th the third year, on average, the highest one dam can go down actually to 155 or something. And even if we consider, if you, see, if you can see these gray lines, which is a standard deviation to reflect the dry or wet conditions and the stream flow variability, 
in case of a dry year, the highest one dam can reach actually down to one to 150, which is very close to the minimum operating level of highest one dam. You know, the minimum operating level of highest one dam is 140, 147. So it can actually go down, but this is the, the worst case scenario. I mean, if Ethiopia will fill the dam in three years, we are still following the current stress conditions. If we, if we kind of increasing the stress a little bit to 0.7, I mean, the, the slope or this declining, declining Sorry. Yeah. Uh, this declining in the, in the highest one dam level, you can see that's kind of improving, but not that much. It, can, it still can go down on average to 160 or something. Let's look at the more kind of optimistic uh, optimistic scenario if Ethiopia to fill the dam in seven years and fo following the current stresses or even changing the stresses we can see that on average the highest one dam level will be a kind of flat or if it started 169 it can end up at 169 but again keep in mind that if we consider the stream flow variability these gray lines the dry condition can force the highest one dam by the end of the seven year to go down maybe to 160 or maybe uh, around, yeah, around 160, 165 uh, of operation level. Uh, again, I mean, if we test the, the stress for uh, 0.7 during the summer, that, that, that there is a still a kind of uh, flat uh, highest one dam level during the seven year filling scenario. As, I'm, as I said, this is the worst case scenario if, if uh, the highest one dam level is at its lower it's at a very low level, but if we look more at a more optimistic scenario, which is actually these thick lines, the thick lines here are showing the optimistic scenario if the highest one dam level would be at a, at a kind, when the, the GERD starts its operation, the highest one dam is at a, high, it's at a high level. So the one I showed in the previous slide, the highest one dam is starting, it uh, was at like around 169. What if we say, oh, no, the high sun dam at, when the GERD starts its filling will be at 180 or 179, which is a situation I think we have this year and last year as well. In this case, still for the three-year filling scenario, we, we will see a declining slope or declining trend in the, in the highest one dam level, but not that much. By the end of the three year, it can reach around 173 or 172, something like that. Uh, again, if we change the stress, it will go down maybe to 174 or 175. But I think it's this is very optimistic. So it's also it ref, it's kind of uh, emphasizing that the starting level of high swan dam is very important to consider when we do these scenarios. For the seven-year filling scenario, it's actually very good because in this case, uh, I think. Uh, by the end of the seven years, the highest one dam will be a kind of maintaining its operating level around 175. So here's just a summary for the importance of uh, considering different filling scenarios and uh, the, the, the low head level, which is a kind, as I said, the worst case scenario versus the high head level, which is the, the optimistic scenario. And the Y axis is showing the, the highest one dam level high aswan dam level at the end of the GERD filling period. So uh, this is only for the average, it's not considering the stream flow variability. So uh, for example, I was, for the low uh, head level, if we look at the green line, so the green line is showing an stress conditions of 0.8, probably on average for the highest one dam level to, to, return about, to return to its operating level around 175, it needs like eight years of filling scenarios. So, the good thing about this figure is that it can be used like, for example, saying uh, if, if Egypt will not be changing the stress in the downstream, which is a blue line, how long it will take to for the highest one dam level to uh, kind of uh, returning to its operating level by the end of the feeling, uh, feeling years. So the blue line actually is showing that even 12 years of feeling, the highest one dam level will not be able to return back to its operating level. And the, the, the level at that time will be lower than the 175. It can even reach, as I said, 170 or something. Uh, yeah. So another thing we looked at is uh, the recovery of high sun dam. And I think uh, I haven't seen many people talking about that, which is how even if we forgot about the feeling and the feeling is done and then the that the GERD will start operating, so then 
uh, how much it will, uh, how long it will take for the Hyos One Dam to recover its normal operation. So this is actually, again, we use the reservoir modeling and then we looked at the, the, uh, how much it will take for the, for the Hyos One Dam to recover. And this is showing an example here, for example, if we following the three-year filling scenario with the current stress, it might take up to 11 years for the Hyos One Dam to, to recover its operation. So recovery means here that the Hyos One Dam, after the filling, it, it wants to go back to its normal operation, which I define as a 175 uh, in September. So if, if it wants to go back to 175, I think it will it might take 11 years if this is for the three filling three year filling scenario. But if you look more about like seven years or something, it will it will be it will be taking less. And just a summary here for uh, for this number of recovery years, uh, giving different filling scenarios and also for different stress conditions for different uh, starting highest one dam level. You can see there is it's 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 varying based on the filling scenario. Even we can, if we look at the, this scenario, like the, the worst case scenario that Egypt will not be changing the stress and the highest one dam level is at a very low level. And then the Ethiopia, will, for example, if it's following a three-year filling scenario, it might take up to 10 or 11 years. And then if it's filling, it's filling the dam in seven years, for example, it might take up to five years on average. But again, considering the stream flow variability, it can go up to 20 years if it's a very dry conditions in the upstream and uh, and then there is not enough water to come in the downstream it might come for it might go up for the recovery years to 20 years so th i think this is a very important also aspect to consider when we we talk about the adaptation of highest one dam so just to summarize there are many factors i hear sh i i to interrupt hisham uh, sorry to interrupt i think your screen has stopped sharing oh really i'm sorry yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. So I think I stopped here, right? Yes. Okay, so yeah. I think. Okay, so this is actually the second one I, uh, I said. It's uh, the figure that I was showing for uh, the different, uh, yeah, just the, the different stress conditions, different feeling scenarios, and also the number of recovery years. And I was explaining this uh, panel that Egypt might, um, the highest one that might take around uh, 11, 10 to 11 years to recover back to its normal operating level, which is 175. Uh, if we, uh, if Ethiopia to fill the dam in two years, and if it's filling in seven years, it might take down at the, on average five years. But again, considering the stream flow variability, if it's a dry conditions, it might go up to 20 years or something. Uh, so again, here's the table for the different factors. So the GERD, uh, uh, I, I consider only not all the factors, but I consider the main factors like the GERD inflow, if it's uh, and the stream flow variability, dry, normal versus wet years, the GERD filling, three years, seven years filling scenarios, mm -hmm. other scenarios as well, the white night inflow, I mean, it, might, it can also be dry or wet, the starting level of head or the downstream stress conditions. But there is some other factors that we have to consider, especially, for example, what if Sudan uh, pl plan to kind of increasing the water use for irrigation or uh, they have new projects for irrigation or they have new dams or something. So there are other many factors that we need to consider maybe for future studies, maybe also how the, the hydropower generation in, for the GERD will, will be working or uh, how the dam will be operating uh, if it's because we follow a certain way like that the dam will be kind of like the hydropower uh, generation will be following a kind of a uniform demand curve or something. So these factors are, I think, important to be considered as well for uh, the future studies. So just the key findings from this study that the filling scenario probably of more than seven years will have less impacts on head operation. Head can adapt its GERD filling, especially during the summer months if they can kind of controlling the stress in the downstream. But again, the most important that the countries of the Nile River, they have to negotiate to uh, agree for a long-term framework. Uh, this framework is not only for the GERD, but also for the future transboundary projects. So I hope that all these countries working together for, uh, for a good and a long-term framework. So just uh, quickly about the last couple of slides, the future direction. And I, recently we, we also developed this uh, approach for uh, adapting reservoir operation. It's called the FARO. So the FARO is basically using the forecast information. So uh, and to be just to simplify this, uh, if we if we know the, the 
the stream flow for next month or maybe for next three months, can we kind of operating the reservoir in a better way or not? So this is the main question that I'm asking uh, in this work. Uh, maybe I, if you want to learn more about that, maybe I can introduce this later, maybe, or maybe tomorrow, maybe uh, give you a hint about what we did here as well. But also uh, other thing that we uh, looked at is uh, uh, how to kind of uh, uh, making this work more uh, kind of operational so people can use it by kind of uh, informing decision making and uh, it's not only doing research but how also to the bridge this gap between the research and, and practice so we i built this uh, satellite based uh, operational system which is called uh, nebras and probably people who are speaking arabic do know the meaning of nebras so the nebras idea i mean you know it's a kind of like the light or something so my idea is like maybe this system will give the light for the night based into how to uh monitor and advising the operation of the reservoirs and i will talk about this for in the session tomorrow the final session will be about actually uh, showing you this system how the system is working it's running every day giving the i mean using these models that we use and giving an information about the highest one dam operation in terms of the storage and the release so i'll talk about this tomorrow in this session i think that's everything i have i just want to thank uh, all the organizations that are supporting this work it's a uh, University of, of Washington, and uh, uh, part of this work is actually supported by a NASA grant. Also, I want to thank uh, the, my former university, Alexander University, and also the Ministry, Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation in Egypt for uh, getting access for some of the data that I need for this work, uh, as well as the SASP research group, all the members of uh, uh, our research group, uh, Shariar, Nishan, and Indira. And also uh, would like to thank the Quasi because they offered me a course actually on the food energy water nexus, which has helped me a lot in formulating some of the ideas of my research. So I'll uh, things stop here. Uh, I'll leave you with this uh, beautiful sunset on the Nile in, uh, in Aswan. It's very close to the Aswan Dam. And uh, you know, this, uh, this is very, uh, it's a very famous, saying in Egypt that Egypt is a gift to the Nile and it had been seen like a long time ago but by the Greek historian Herodotus and uh, yeah I hope our work uh, and all we are work that to keep Egypt is a gift of the Nile so thanks everyone for uh, listening and uh, I'll be very happy for 10 question and sorry if I take more time I think we start a little late but we can extend the question if you have any questions we can uh, uh, start taking questions now yeah and as I said in the beginning uh, uh, feel free to uh, to ask me a question in the chat box, even if it's, uh, you want to ask it in uh, in Arabic. Please, uh, please, yeah, feel free to send me the, uh, the your question if it's in Arabic, and I'll be uh, happy to translate it. And then uh, uh, I'll do my best to translate it. I'm not that good, <laughs> but I'll do my best to translate it, and then uh, maybe uh, taking your, uh, uh, I mean, translate it and try to answer it. So let's take a question. Uh, yeah, Awad, you can go ahead and ask a question. Awad Mohammed, you raise your hand. Yeah, you can go ahead and ask a question. Yes. Hello, how are you? Thank you uh, very much for your useful and informative uh, presentation. Thanks. Yeah. So um, uh, as the sediment deposition increase, a reduction in the reservoir capacity took place, which in turn uh, affect the discharge. So my question here, to what extent uh, these models consider the changes in bed level or it is negligible when compared to the entire reservoir capacity. Oh, you mean uh, the bed level for the, 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 like because of the sediment or something? Like you mean the bed level for the, the Grand Renaissance at Fugan Dam or the, for, uh, for, uh, for the, the highest one dam? No, you mentioned that there's uh, uncertainties in the uh, model discharge when compared to the uh, oh, on reserve, the first, right? on, the, on the first study, right? Yes. Okay. So, so you, you uh, mean to what extent the model uh, just consider these uh, changes? Okay. In bed back yes. Okay. So actually, the model we use. I'm sorry. So the model, the model we use is the variable infiltration capacity model. It's uh, it's actually <laughs> simulating only the naturalized flow. So when I what I mean by naturalized flow, it is not considering the regulated flow like the the, the reservoirs or the dams along the river. And, but we tested actually, I mean, how, how if we compare our, our results with uh, the regulated flow, we didn't, we didn't, uh, didn't find that much uh, changes. 
uh, if we compose a naturalized flow to the regulated flow, because you know most of the dams in the, the Nile Basin, except maybe the Highest One Dam or the Gert, they are not doing that much op uh, operations or uh, changing that much in terms of the regulation. But then the few question again, I, I didn't, uh, we didn't consider this changing in the bed level in, inside the model, the VIC model, because I, I, I believe it doesn't have this capability to, to make a change in the bed level. But uh, what I can say also that uh, when you calibrate the soil parameters and, uh, and different parameters in the model, they might be taking into account some other aspects. It's not the bed level of the reservoir, but they will take into account some other aspects in terms of the, uh, the maybe the soil and uh, uh, the land use as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if I, this is, I, I answered your question or not, but yeah, feel free. Yes, yes, uh, now everything is clear. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, who else? Muhammad Ahmad, yeah, go ahead and ask it. Yeah, th thank you for your, uh, your good presentation. Uh, I need to know the the, the correlation that you have uh, speak about in the various of uh, your uh, slides. Okay, because I know that the the, the fluctuation of any uh, any quantity uh, takes place in an uh, in a small fluctuation part. Okay. So from from a statistical uh, perspective, uh, you need to like re-simulate because uh, you speak about the the person uh, first moment uh, correlation, and I know that for spatial data analysis, it person is is not the best uh, correlation method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go, uh, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Actually, because. So, so, so in terms of the, the statistical metrics, we, di we didn't use only the R-square. I know the R-square is not the best. We use also the NSE, the Nash Sutcliffe uh, efficiency. We use a root, root mean square error. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of these statistical metrics in the literature. <laughs> and uh, we use also the NSE. The NSE is a, is a good indication in terms of the variability, uh, to capture the variability. Maybe I didn't show it here, but it's probably in the paper. Uh, in papers published in GHM. I think it's in the paper already, the NSE, and the NSE, maybe it's around 0.65 or something, I believe. I cannot remember exactly the numbers, but I believe the NSE also reflects a, a, a good agreement between both the, the simulated and the model flow. Uh, uh, do, 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 you, do, you know, do, you, do you use any kind of uh, Bayesian statistics in this uh, charts? Can you say again, the Bayesian statistics? Yeah. Oh, you mean to to do a business statistics like uh, special statistics? Yeah. Okay, I got your point. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I thought you were, you mean just for the you know actually here I I also I, also, uh, I did it only for like a kind of you the, you speak, the outlet. You, so. you, you speak about about predicting uh, like uh, the outcome for the events in the future. Oh, you mean this outcome in the. So you don't you don't mean this uh, calibration and validation of the model? Do you mean do you mean something else? I, I, uh, what I need to know that is those chart is like dynamic, or this is a, the, there is no uh, presentive uh, deterministic equation. Okay. Do, do, do you mean the slide that I'm the slide I'm showing now or a different slide? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, this slide is it's you are asking if it's a dynamic or. Uh, yeah, because. I, yeah, because when after after you finish your model, everything gets uh, like uh, changes, okay. Mm -hmm. So you need to like rely on some statistical methods to uh, reproduce uh, something more yeah, that can be more trusted. So so okay. So let me. Yeah, uh, I think there is something with I don't know you. So we, we, what we did, we do first something called the calibration. So the calibration of the model that we do the model for five years, okay? And mm. calibrate the parameters for that. And then we do, later we do something called validation. And the validation is actually not to changing the parameter, but testing the model. So I think this is answering what you're saying. I, I, I think so. So the validation is not playing with the model. So just threw the model away and assume that the model is, is ready. Then you run, you run the model you run the model for uh, for the parameters that you calibrated, 
and you see how the model perform. And this is actually what I'm showing here in the right panel. So the right panel is showing that the model, even without changing any parameters, it's performing, I think, I mean, it's, it's still performing very well in terms of simulating the, the stream flow. So that's actually the difference between okay. the calibration and validation. So, and actually they are doing it for different okay. years. The calibration is for five years and the validation is later for different five years. Is it, this is answering your okay. question? So, 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 so the, 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 top, the top one is the actual and the, 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 the bottom is what you are simulating. Oh, let me check the colors again. Yeah, the, 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 the blue one, the blue one is the blue one is a simulated. The red one is the measure. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is, is the fluctuation between the red and the blue line is not uh, like 100% matching. Yeah, and that's, I mean, <laughs> that's what I, I, I said it's expected because I mean, the model will not 100% getting uh, the results. We are trying to do our best with the models and you know, we are using satellite as well. So we are trying to do our best and this is the idea of using hydrologic models. We will not get a perfect, perfect, uh, modeling of the situation. So we are trying to do our best. I think I, I'm, I'm trying to improve this model now uh, by introducing more like uh, uh, water management components like reservoirs or uh, or, uh, or uh, irrigation or something like that. So I'm trying to improve the model as well, but this is the, you know, it's a kind of ongoing effort that if we can improve the model, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Yeah, I really appreciate your question. Uh, any, I think we might have anyone else raising your hand. Let me check. Okay, so we have a Muhammad Al Muhammad Alamein raising your hand, and uh, we have a question in the chat box. Okay, let's take uh, Muhammad Alamein, and then I'll go to the question on the on the chat box. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you, Hisham. Uh, I got a question concerning the Google Earth engine. Uh, to what extent could it be an alternative to the GIS? Yeah, we can come for that in the practical session for sure. But uh, I mean, it's doing everything I, I believe in Google Earth Engine, uh, in, in, in ArcGIS. I mean, for all the applications we use in our group, I think we we don't need the ArcGIS anymore. Maybe, I mean, to be honest, I mean, to be honest, let me say that again, because to be honest, I'm still using ArcGIS, but I'm using ArcGIS sometimes just to produce the, the final plots for applications or something. but. To do any kind of processing, I'm doing it in Google Earth Engine, and uh, okay. uh, yeah, I think everything will can be done in Google Earth Engine now, uh, uh, in terms of processing and, and especially downloading the data as well. And I'll, I'll talk about that maybe in the practice session, and also maybe tomorrow okay. when I'll be presenting my the, this Nebra system, because it's also getting the data from the Google Earth Engine as well. So I'll, I want to give this tomorrow in my uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So the, I think this might be the last question before going to break uh, from Hadir. Uh, Hadir Abdelmenem is asking for the impact of GERD scenario at the highest one dam. Did you consider the variation of Ivabu, transpiration, and the effect of present reservoir along the Nile, such as Roseras, Sinar, and Murray Dam, which might, difference, which might differ the simulated results? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, and as I said, the VIC model that we are using, it's not considering uh, the reservoirs and dams, but we did the sensitivity or to look at if this will be impacted or not. And what we found that most of these dams are not that much regulating the flow in the, in the Nile River. And if we kind of neglecting it, it will not change the simulation that much, especially that we did the calibration at Khartoum, which is the outlet of the Blue Nile uh, downstream of Roseras or Sinar. And so, uh, the, the calibration of the, uh, the, the calibration actually parameters sometimes it took into account also some of the, the irrigation that's happening in the in the in the in the upstream. Uh, so I think this is the, the the answer for part of the question, which is considering the the, the dams. Uh, in terms of the, I think the variation in the evapotranspiration. Uh, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I think it might be. Uh, yeah, if I'm wrong, just correct me, idea. But I think you you might mean the evapotranspiration and of the same of these reservoirs along the along the Nile, like the Roseros or uh, Sinar. Um, so I'm not sure this will 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 have that much effect or not. Especially that we you know we are looking at kind of like uh, we didn't got 
too much details onto the different variables because we are looking more at like a big picture of the, the GERD and highest one dam. For sure, there is many parameters between the GERD and the highest one dam that might affect this. But I think they might have a kind of maybe less significant, I, I would say less significant impacts compared to the factors that we tested. And as I said in the table that I showed for the different assessment scenario, uh, assessment factors, there is many other factors we also can consider, but uh, I just trying to, I focus on the main or the primary factors that actually like the stream flow and uh, the, the highest one dam level, because I think this probably will be the, the, the major factors. And some of these actual factors can be come into like kind of overlapping with, with the stream flow variability, because if you remember the, the gray lines I was showing, it's showing the stream flow variability, if it's dry or wet conditions. So something like this will, I believe it will come inside these uh, uh, variations as well. So I, I hope I answered your question idea, but yeah, feel free if you want to talk, uh, talk later in person or something. I think we have, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll take the last question because it's from uh, Telegram from Ethiopia. So, uh, so it will be like, to be fair with everyone, we take a question from uh, Egypt to Sudan and let's take the question from Turgan. Yeah, Turgan, you can go ahead, you raise your hand so you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Turgan, can you hear me? I mean, I think you are still muted. If you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we can read. Okay. Thank you for your presentation and Thanks. your timely research paper. Yeah. Well, what I have a comment for your paper is while stating your statement of problem using this VIC hydrogen right. modeling, why yeah. not you used a cascade reservoir operation model from Ethiopian highlands to the downstream of Egypt Delta? because it may consider different variables which may affect the upstream, the middle, as well as the downstream users, depending on the demand, as well as the population, what they have, not only the concentrating on the heart, and right. also what you need to touch, what are the advantages of GERD for the middle, as well as the downstream countries. In this case, in, you can say Egypt or HAD. Right. Why not touch? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sergan. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what you said. I mean, as, as I said, I try to do my best in terms of modeling because I'm, uh, I'm doing my PhD, so the time or, and the funding we are having is a kind of limited a little bit. So I'm planning to improve, as, as I said, I'm improving this model now using more reserve, including more reservoir, more water management components. And I know there is other models that can consider also the population, uh, the, the, the different water uses, not only the irrigation, they can also use a industrial municipal and so on. And uh, the point that you mentioned also, which is very important, how the GERD can, uh, can, can benefit the downstream. I think, yeah, there's something I mentioned in the introduction. I didn't touch it in my, in, in my research, but it's not like intentionally, just because uh, I don't have that much information and that, that much data from Ethiopia uh, and, and Sudan, but I agree with you, it might help. And as I said in the beginning, in, the, uh, in uh, uh, protecting Sudan, for example, from the, the flooding or something. And also it's, uh, as I said, the hydropower generation, if you remember this electricity, map I showed for Africa. Yeah, we know that Africa is suffering from the access to electricity and probably the GERD, the hydropower, uh, that the GERD operation actually will help in uh, producing the hydropower that can help the, the, the rest of Africa. That's, I, I, I need to emphasize that as well. And I think I showed that in the beginning of my slides, but it's not including my research. I'm sorry for that, but I don't have that much data to, to include it. Yeah, I might, I might, I might just show something about actually the hydropower, hydropower operation and the GERD in the break if you want. I can show you some of the slides which you might be interested in it in terms of the, the hydropower that will be generated from the GERD. I can show you, we have another study, I, I will show it to you maybe in the break, but thanks for your okay. question. I, okay, okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, let's stop here because I think we are, yeah, we already uh, passed the time. So uh, uh, the next session should start at we should have started at 9.15, but I'm sorry that uh, I just tried to take all the questions for today. But we can start 9.20 for the next presentation. It will be uh, uh, by India Bors on the CBAL approach. I will probably introduce you that how I use the CBAL in my presentation, but let's take a break for 10 minutes and then we will meet again at uh, 10.30 for the second presentation on using satellite 
uh, observations to estimate the evapotranspiration uh, with the CBAL approach. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining this first session, and see you in 10 minutes. Thanks very much.